I think I'll read first from I read first from a new poem, um, and then I'll share with you some work from my book, which came out last year. Um, so what brings me here and what interests me in working with refugees and migrants, so I came to the UK at the age of six in 1993. Um, I first lived in Newcastle, and at that point, I already spoke English uh, fluently, but I didn't speak Geordie English. Um, <laughs> so being, being there and that in itself, that experience was very interesting, to say the least. I really loved living in the Northeast. Uh, I had a Geordie accent for a good while as well, but now it seems to have uh, disappeared. Um, I can bring it back, though, <laughs> from time to time. Um, so I'm really interested in working with people who've perhaps um, migrated and getting a sense of their singular experience, because everyone has these different experiences. And even smaller migrations, like from south to north, north to south, all of these kind of things interest me, because there's so many shifts as you move from place to place. A friend of mine is from St. Albans, and he, and he works in an opticians in St. Albans, and he was saying, the people in London wear different kinds of glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so like he's, um, he's just come to study in London, study librarianship in London, so he's leaving his job at the opticians. And they said to him, we might have to give you a different pair of glasses so you can be like those London folk. Um, so I'm interested in all these kind of different experiences that you get. So working with um, refugees and migrants allows me to access some of that and to hear about um, people's varying stories. Um, I got interested in the process of kind of thinking about those kind of varied experiences. I got interested in the idea of how you identify yourself. Um, so whether you take on a name that someone else gives you uh, like an injurious name to identify yourself and try and spin it around, try and twist it, try and take ownership over it, or whether you reject that name and make a name of your own. So I wrote this poem in response to that kind of idea. The poem is called Calling a Spade a Spade. Um, I guess by way of explanation, I'll read two of the quotes that kind of set this poem in motion, and then I'll read some sections from the poem. And through those two things, it should explain itself. If it doesn't, Let's chat in the interval. I no longer write white writing, yet white writing won't stop writing me. And that's from an American poet called Thomas Sayers Ellis. Um, and this is another American poet by the name of Saul Williams. Perhaps it is something like how old schoolers would say you heal from a snake bite, having to spit out the venom again and again until there is no more. Um, so at the moment, I think this is called Love Poem to the Word Blackie. You sly devil, lounging in a pinter script, or pitched from a transit van's rolled down window. My shadow on this unlit road, though you've been smuggled from polite conversation. So when a friend of a friend has you poised on his lips, you are not what he means. No call for bald fist, since he's only signifying on the sign, making wine from the bad blood of history. Think of how you came into my life that day of leaves strewn as I had never seen them strewn, knocking me about the head with your dark hands. The N-word. You came back as rubber lips, pepper grains, blick. You're so black, you're blick, and how the words stuck to our tongues eclipsing, or so we thought all fear that any moment anyone might notice and we'd be deemed the wrong side of a night sky. Lately, you are a pretty little lighty who can get dark because even now, dark means street, which means beast, which means leave now for Ben Fleet. These days, I can't watch a music video online without you 
trolling in the comments. Alterity. Uh, and alterity just means otherness, difference. Our matchmaker, the only other, other kid in class, was my best friend after the urge passed to slap your negritude out of his mouth. Knowing what it was to have the spotlight, we stood in line for auditions in the hall. In lieu of a third, we were the two magi, honoring a blue-eyed plastic messiah, bearing our gifts of thrifty chinoiserie. The Holy Mother was a girl named Phyllis. I had my words down three weeks before the show. Come, Melchior. Let's make the best of the light. Um, and this one is called the cricket test. Uh, some of you might remember um, there was an MP by the name of Norman Tebbit. One of the things that he said was that you can tell that someone has assimilated into British culture when they start to support British sports teams. If they start to support the uh, British or the English cricket team, that's when you'll know <laughs> that they're a true native. Um, the cricket test. Picture a cricket match. First week at upper school. Blacks versus whites. That slight hesitation on choosing a side, and you're close to knowing why I've been trying to master this language. Raised as I was, some words in this argo catch in the throat, seemingly made for someone else, the sticking point from which all else is fixed. We lost to a one-handed catch. After the match, our changing room was a shrine to apartheid. When I crossed the threshold, Danny asked me why I'd stand here when I could be there with my kind. Um, and I'll finish with one of the later poems in the sequence. This has been one of those poems, occasionally poems come to me in a kind of flood and I don't really <clears throat> understand who it was that wrote the thing. Uh, and it's all very good. It kind of doesn't really involve me. I'm just sort of there. It happens. I move on, make a cup of tea. Uh, you know. Um, and then occasionally I have poems like this. I've been, I started writing this poem in maybe 2010 or something like that, or maybe 2009, really. Um, and I've just come to the point of having the last two sections in mind, and they're nearly there. So I'll read you what is at the... Um, what is towards the end of the sequence um, at the moment? So there's a poem by Robert Lowell uh, called Colloquy in Black Rock. Um, and this is one of those poems that kind of deploys injurious words, uh, uses hate speech in a very casual sort of way. Um, this is one of those poems that speaks to the privilege of the writer, that they can use one of these words and not really think about the effect of it because that word has never been used against them. Um, so one of the problems if you study English literature is the history of English literature is a kind of history of, um, I guess, white men, I suppose. Um, <laughs> So you're going to come up against certain words used in a casual manner that can be very injurious uh, to people who are other than white men. Um, and if you study English literature in a, in a place like I studied it, you kind of skirt around some of the issues. And so that explores that idea. Just when I think I've shaken you off, you're there, innocuous, in Lowell's poem, a flag out of fashion, still flown by a patriot. The seminar tutor tiptoes round you now. Ours is to note the working mind behind the word, not what remains unsaid. There is an us and them. Cut to requisite dreads, beads, a wooden pendant in the shape of a home I can't remember. 
the autobiography of Malcolm X. Our first time alone together when she asks me why no one in my pictures is white.